familiar. It's a good spot. I just never call on anybody there. Perfect. Sorry. I found the right spot. Yeah, well, it, it is. Though, though my wife is behind you, I, I can't occasionally glance at her for the disapproving glance when I know I've messed up. <laughs> uh, for those who came in after I said it, grab your Bible and be nosing around Matthew 5, 6, and 7 for things you recognize. And, and then I'm going to ask you to share that in just a minute. I'd like you to peek around first and uh, look for things that are familiar to you. That probably won't be very hard. Matthew 5, 6, and 7. What have you seen that's familiar to you? The Beatitudes. Uh, the Beatitudes. Maybe if someone doesn't know anything else about the Sermon on the Mount, they know that that opening segment has those Beatitudes listed there. What else do you recognize? Judge, judge not, lest you be, so that you be not judge. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1. In fact, even unbelievers, though they may not recognize it as part of the Sermon on the Mount, they recognize it as being in the Bible. And how many times in our culture have people objected to the calling out of sin, quoting part of the Sermon on the Mount? Judge not that you be not judged. Yes. What else? Salt and light. Salt and light. Yeah, that is a, that is a section of this that especially resonates with me as Jesus moves out of the this, uh, this, this, this preamble with the character of kingdom dwellers and into the impact of that on the world, uh, I find myself coming back to that segment again and again and again, especially in the context of evangelism. It's, it's a piece of that, that we're meant to have an impact on the world uh, around us. So I'm, I'm like you. That, that's a, I, I don't know that I use any portion of the Sermon on the Mount more than I use that segment in my teaching. Christ came to fulfill the law. Good. What else do you want? Love your enemies. One of the more harder segments of the Sermon on the Mount. So maybe we don't dwell there as much because you know, it's some of that stuff we wish wasn't in the Bible in the first place. Wise man built his house upon the rock. Can, can you lead us in that song? Uh, well, yeah, that would work. That would work too for uh, for Matthew five. I, I thought about that closing uh, parable because what it means is even um, even the little children who may not identify it necessarily with the Sermon on the Mount know portions of the sermon, the wise man song, right? See, I know the hand gestures. I will not do them, but I do know them, <laughs> and uh, and and they identify with that part of the sermon. Yeah. What else? Yeah, in chapter 6, pray like this. The Lord's Prayer is a very familiar segment. But we don't talk about it much. We don't. Why do you think that is? We're afraid of being rich. Yeah, well, yes, it's, it's, it's been a portion of the sermon, I think, misused, like several portions of it, and maybe that makes us a little reluctant to go there. Maybe we'll... Maybe we'll go and spend some time there in the class just to work against that trend. What else do you recognize? Sorry? Oh, how about the end of chapter 6? Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, the part about not being materialistically minded and minding the things. And what's the opposite of the materialistic minder? Uh, 
Oh, well, okay, earlier, yeah, lay up treasures in heaven and not on the earth. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Man, that's a big quote. Isn't there a whole, isn't there a whole song about that or something? Not remembering? Yeah. What's that? The whole Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. I, I wanted you to think about that uh, because I wanted you to notice how easily we can just cite the, recite those and how easy it is just to glance through these chapters and say, oh, I recognize this and I recognize that. I think there's a reason for that. This is familiar territory for most disciples. The golden rule. How could we leave that off? We'll have to make a poster and put that wall. Walls. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, the two ways. Uh, and I think there's a reason this is familiar to us. The sermon finds its way into lots of the things that we do. Did you notice that the sermon was in the sermon this morning? I hate to ask this question because it always just breaks my heart. Do you remember what part of the sermon was in the sermon? Verse 21. Yeah, verse 21. You and I are going to go to dinner this week. Um, yeah, verse 21. <laughs> I was going to leave that part out. But, yeah. but, but yes, and, and how often think that you know the, the Sermon on the Mount, at least pieces of it pop up in sermons or maybe maybe in a Bible class setting. We borrow a few verses here or a paragraph there to plug into to whatever we're trying to talk about, whatever try, we're trying to teach. Um, does any part of the sermon especially resonate with you, have special meaning to you? Well, I really wasn't looking for a yes or no there. I was actually... How strange is it that I did not know that that was my wife's favorite? Because, which one is that? Golden rule. Treat others the way you want to be treated. I learned something about my wife in the class tonight. That is her favorite verse. Anything else especially resonate with you? Yes, sir. Yeah, what he says there about marriage and divorce finds its way into this, into this very practical sermon. Yes. Anything else? Tell me more about that. My life doesn't line up with Oh, yeah, it, it does. At, at least in places, it is particularly challenging, isn't it? I think I mentioned earlier that segment at the end of chapter 5 about loving your enemies. Why couldn't have God said, hey, be ambivalent about your enemies and just leave them alone and stay away from them? Because I would be okay with that. I'm not, a, I'm not a brawler. I don't want to go hit my enemy in the nose. I just don't want to have anything to do with it, but... But, but, yeah, love and do good and pray. And that, yeah, hard stuff. Anything else especially resonate with you? Not just that you recognize it, but it really speaks to you in a powerful way. Yes. And the contrasting there with the Gentiles and the Jews who do that for public display, you do it in secret. The God who's the one who matters will see in secret, and He will know and reward. Yes, ma'am. I think it's the physical, our clothing, our food. It's, it's not that we do not have to worry about it, but we do it because it's worthy. It doesn't matter. Uh, the anxiety we feel about stuff. There are some segments of this that that strike me as being particularly meaningful to our culture and that is that part at the end of chapter six i think really really speaks to our struggle with our our stuff um the other reason i think this teaching rings so familiar to us is that it pops up in other places it's not limited to these three chapters in fact i am convinced that the Sermon on the Mount was not a one-off where jesus found himself in this place and got up and delivered this sermon this one time. In fact, if you back up a little bit, and just bear in mind, we will spend more time outside the sermon than inside the sermon in this first class. If you back up to verse 23, chapter 4, verse 23, the text says, Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now, that is a prelude to the beginning of the sermon, and, and I think what you have beginning in chapter 5 is a sample of what that looked like. What he describes in verse 23, 
uh, is, is what is illustrated for us in chapters 5, 6, and 7. So he's going around Galilee preaching in these different places. This is the kind of stuff that he said. In fact, in Luke chapter 6, you may already know, there's another very similar sermon to this one. And so the scholars debate, is it the Sermon on the Mount? Because there are differences. Or is this a similar sermon preached at another time in another place? I'm not going to go there with you because... I really don't care that much about that. It's an interesting question to wrestle with. But, but, but I think probably what's going on is that this, this is Jesus' stump speech. Do you know what I mean by that? If you go and hear a, a presidential candidate speak, you might be inclined to think that this was a speech he just gave this one time just for your audience, right? The truth is, he got on the airplane and he flew to the next town and, and guess what speech he gave? Yeah, the same speech. That's what candidates do. They have this stump, stump speech. And they even may modify it here or there a little bit. But ideas and themes uh, work their way in, often into to, to all of their speeches. And I think that's true of what Jesus taught when he proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. I think this is sort of his stump speech. And so it just kind of comes up again and again and again. Uh, in different places, in different settings. And we find that as we go through the gospel, which just adds to our familiarity. Even if it isn't a quote from the Sermon on the Mount, it's like what was in the Sermon on the Mount and reminds us of that. So I have to confess that uh, when I decided about a month ago to do this class, it is our familiarity with the sermon that I thought most about. It challenged me. Uh, so, what can you get up and say that hasn't been said before? I mean, honestly, do you think that I will have something new on the Beatitudes? Is that what brought you to this class? David will have an insight of the Beatitudes? We have never had before. If that's why you came, you will be disappointed. Jeff's class is next door. Uh, uh, how do you make fresh material that has been around for a long, long time and you already know so very well. I thought a lot about that. Uh, please don't hear me devalue repetition uh, because I do think it's healthy to go back to the text and to study things we have studied before. Um, and I will imagine that at some point we will end up going through the text and considering its powerful teaching and challenging applications, as Mark said. But I didn't want to settle for the routine. I, I, I'm always pondering, is there, is there perhaps more to be seen here than we typically see when we just start at chapter 5 and verse 1 and, and walk through there? So, so that has been my mental challenge for the last month, uh, trying to figure that out. And, and so I want to give you a couple of ideas that I've come up with, and you can... Uh, you can work these with me and see what you think. The first thing that I want to challenge us to do in this class is to read the sermon in a different way. Did some of y'all pick up the, uh, the stapled sheet that I put back there? So what I did first is I, I took the text of Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and I removed all of the chapter and verse divisions. Uh, I, I did add some paragraphs. Um, don't ask me how I came up with that because I don't have a magical answer. I used my Bible and then just came up with my own sections, which means you are more than welcome to totally trash and questions. Why did you make a paragraph there, right? Jeff does it with the guys who did the Bible all the time. Why did you, why did you put the paragraph divisions there? The sad thing is I've come to believe that he's right about most of his complaints on that. So, so but, but, what I'd like you to do is read the sermon as they heard it because it wasn't broken down into chapters and verses. And, and then when you read it, uh, at least once each week, try to read it all the way through without stopping. It takes about 15 minutes. I timed it. Unless you're a slow reader like me, then maybe upwards of 20. But my goodness, 20 minutes out of a week. It's not very much time, is it? And what I have discovered in my own personal study habits is that this stuff reads differently when you read it all the way through as opposed to 
you know, dissecting it chapter by chapter and verse by verse. I discovered that with Titus back at the end of last year when we were going to use it for our theme this year. I just started reading Titus every day. It's a little bitty short book from beginning to end. And it's amazing how the text, you hear it differently when you read it that way as opposed to chopping it up into chapters and, and verses. So, so the people who sat at his feet uh, on this occasion, that's how they heard it, at least this portion of it. That's another question I have about the sermon. Did we get the whole sermon, or is what we have in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 the executive summary? I don't know about that. Maybe there is more to it. Maybe we got largely paragraph headings. Who knows? Uh, certainly if Luke 6 is the same sermon, there was stuff that Matthew recorded that Luke didn't and so forth. So uh, we'll, we'll use that little experiment first. Try, try reading it all the way through. I would urge you to do that several times during your week. The second thing I want us to do as we go through the class is to start looking for specific things. So up at the top of that sheet, if you have it in red, uh, for class next Sunday, I want you to, to pay attention to what the sermon tells us about Jesus as a teacher. Some of it is pretty obvious. Some of it you have to dig a little bit more. But if you look at chapter 7 at the end for a minute, look at Matthew 7. There is something about Jesus as a teacher that the audience takes note of. So in chapter 7, are you in verse 28? Listen to the way Matthew ends the sermon. He said, when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. So notice, when it says they were amazed at his teaching, it wasn't about content, was it? What was it about? Sorry? Sorry? Authority. Whose authority? His. There was something different about the way this guy delivered the sermon. And so I think that's an idea that ought to be considered. And so what I'd like you to do between now and next Sunday is to read all the way through the sermon. Read it several times. And as you do what do we find there about Jesus as a teacher that was so remarkable to that crowd? I'd like to do some big picture ideas like that over the first couple of classes and we'll see how far that goes and then we'll get into the text and work it some as well and and maybe maybe at least see it with fresh eyes and see some things we haven't appreciated before. I hope so uh, and I hope the class will be a benefit so we try to do that. You have a question for me before we get into the text today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. You know what that means. You know, so what is that about? Right, right. I don't know if that's a question for you exactly, or it just it just surprised me. You know, it's a little. But that that's been true of. I've done an in-depth study of of all of Jesus, and I what I did here is you talk about Luke. I meshed everywhere where these things were repeated and put them together to try to make one sermon. And that's really very interesting. Yeah, it is. Yes. Yeah, the light thing the comes back to it. Thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the lamb of the body, he also did that one. Okay. Yeah. But, but we don't know that one. So See, anyway, I, I do think that, um, that, that one of the reasons that we encounter little snippets from the sermon in other places is because he preached the same sermon again and again and again. And... Um, and it is, it is the gospel of the kingdom. I also think that's an interesting point about the lamp of the body because I, I think that what we tend to do, especially with segments like this, is we read through and embrace the things we get, right? And then what do we do with the things that we don't get? 
<laughs> well, I, I think I'll be okay without that segment today, right? And so, and so maybe, maybe that's something y'all could pitch as we go along. If y'all got some segments you'd like to dig in in more, deep, uh, in more deeply. You know, I've got like, I've got four classes planned. And, uh, and then we'll just see what happens after that. So if y'all want to make suggestions, I'm open to that. Otherwise, you're stuck with whatever map I draw between now and then, okay? I know next week we're going to talk about him as, as a teacher and, uh, and then move on to some other things from there. Um, things you hear, I mean, there's sound bites, right? I mean, there's certain phrases yeah. that you can walk into any church, church, and hear the same things. I mean, they're just universal in their appeal, because by and large, most of the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, they pick up on all the positive mm. things in the Sermon on the Mount, and I think that's why we hear them so much, because they're, they're everywhere. Yes, and and often misused and not understood as as he intended. A big part of that, I think, I think is context, and that's actually a nice segue. Thank you uh, to where I wanted to move next. I, I wanted in this first class to uh, to set the sermon in its setting. Uh, so, if you had asked me um, two years ago. Where does the Sermon on the Mount begin? My answer would have been Matthew 5, verse 1. Or more technically, Matthew 5 and verse 3 is where the teaching begins and goes through chapter 7 and, and verse 27. Um, and really, Matthew 5 gets right to it, right? If you look at verse number 1, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and began to teach them saying, and then it's sermon. So, so other than what seems to be some kind of lightweight logistical matters, we hit 5, and we're right into the middle of the sermon. But candidly, folks, Jeff and Randy over the last two years have corrupted me, and and, and have pushed me to read the Bible in a different way because Jeff hates chapter divisions, right? And with good cause, because the temptation to, be would, to, to me would be to begin the Sermon on the Mount where it begins in chapter 5 and verse 3. But already in chapter 5, there are clues that there is a larger context to be considered. And sometimes thematic threads are being continued that were started before we get to the segment of Scripture we're working with. And so that, that biblical principle we've talked about over and over again about studying things in their context, really, really good rule. And uh, I think what I've learned over the last couple of years working with Jeff and Randy is that the context is often bigger than we realize. So I thought we would spend some time today thinking about the chapters that lead up to the sermon and try to put the sermon in its proper setting and maybe along the way pick up on some bigger ideas that we haven't appreciated before. So there are three words. Uh, just because I have three words doesn't mean I'm making a sermon and you guys are going to sit and listen. Um, but I do want to offer three words that I think serve as connecting threads uh, from the first four chapters into the next three. The one that is most obvious to me is the word crowd. Do you see why I would start there? Look at the end of four and the beginning of five. Do you see why I would start with crowd? So where does, where does chapter 5, verse 1 begin? With the crowd, right? Look at 5.1. When Jesus saw the crowds. And so actually you would think that when we would read that, what would our question be? What, what, what crowds? What crowds are we talking about? Which is why I actually think a much better chapter division would have been back at chapter 4 and verse 23. Listen to me, I've become Jeff criticizing the chapter divisions. But, but I do think that that really does make sense. Uh, look, at chapter, look at chapter 4 in verse 25. 
Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. When Jesus saw the crowd, see how well that just sort of nationally meshes together? Those segments go together. It is these crowds that, uh, that lead to the, the teaching of the sermon. And so peek around in that context and tell me, what do you learn about the crowd? Think about that for a minute, and no detail is too small to pass over. What do we know about the crowd from the end of chapter 4 into the beginning of chapter 5? Okay, one of the things we notice is they are from all over, right? In fact, places are identified, aren't they? So, I don't know how good your Palestine geography is. Oh, you got it? You got it in your mind? Oh, what a foolish thing I said a minute ago then. I apologize. I went ahead and did a map, though, so you could see the thing. Troy, tell them what, we're ta- what, you, just, what you just said. And then, and, 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 and then the area east of the Jordan down there because he answers that t- he, he mentions that too right the land beyond the Jordan would be would be just to the to the south yeah 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 he down he didn't mention Samaria in there so so when when Troy says they came from all over that's exactly the picture that is being painted here these people come from everywhere in fact this really gets more interesting when you appreciate that Decapolis on the east side and the land beyond the Jordan on the east side, those were primarily what kind of areas? Gentile. Gentile areas. So when Matthew says they came from all over, I mean they came from the Gentile regions, which is interesting because in the first four chapters, we've had some other Gentile hints. Does anybody know what they are, just out of curiosity? You studied Matthew before and picked up on the Gentile hints? How about in the genealogies of Jesus? There are some Gentiles. Boy, Matthew was going blasphemous there, wasn't he? There were some Gentiles mentioned in Matthew's genealogy in chapter 1. And then if you go ahead to chapter 4, they quote Isaiah's prophecy Verse 15, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The Gentiles pop up there too. And so it does kind of make you wonder if there isn't this subtle theme threading through these early chapters that Matthew is hinting at that involves Gentile inclusion, which, which may be a piece of what he's saying about the crowd. These people really come from all over because now... Yeah, yeah. It's in Galilee. But if you got people coming all the way from Judea up to Galilee, that's not somebody, you know, local neighborhood. Right, right. So so what does that tell us about the crowd, what you just said? It must be desperate. Uh they're they're looking. Let's say that about them. They're a looking crowd. Or or maybe seeking. Yeah, and that's, so, so, so I wanted that to come up because I want us to think about this seeking part. I actually think this plays into the sermon that we're about to hear. Uh, if you back up again, let's, let's go to verse 23 this time of chapter 4. Jesus was going throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Now notice, and healing every kind of disease every kind of sickness among the people. The news about him spread throughout all Assyria and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with very diseases and pains, demonics, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. So question, contextually, what do you think is drawing the large crowd? Yeah, yeah, I'm wondering... If, if the crowd is so huge, 
because one, some people are saying, I got someone who can heal my disease. I got someone who could cure me. I need to go find Jesus. And that'd make you pack up and go a long way, right? And then I think there's another group of people, you know, we call them rubberneckers in Texas, the people that are looking on the accident on the side of the road. There were people who said, this dude is healing. We need to go, we need to go check that out. We need to go see. And so, and so you have this huge crowd uh, coming to him, but are they committed to him? Surely there are some in the crowd, maybe many in the crowd, are, who are just about the spectacle of it all or about the opportunity to be healed. John 6 makes me think about that, right? When you had the huge crowds follow him and then he preaches the bread of life sermon that just absolutely explodes. And by the end of John 6, everybody's walking away from him, which, which then makes me wonder about the sermon we're about to study. Because could it be that in part the sermon is addressing the motives that bring the people and how really committed they are to be part of the kingdom of God. But, but the one thing that I, I will say though is, I mean there are the, the, the ones with the demons and that's unusual. I mean again, the Bible there's only specific times that there are miracles or there are things out of the natural realm, right? And and they should they would have known that in, in times past there weren't a lot of demon possessed people, and now all of a sudden there are, and and that would cause some of them to at least think about in a higher sense. This healing is not just about the paralytic; it's also about those who the devil has taken over. Well, and and let's be fair, John. When I say that some of the people in the crowd may have had shallow motives, that certainly doesn't mean they all did because there were people who put it together like Nicodemus in John 3, 2. We know you have come from God as a teacher because nobody could do the signs you do unless God is with him. So, so the, the other thing that ties into this, let me add this to our list we're making. Uh, if, you, if you look at verse 25, chapter 4, verse 25, the text says that the crowds were following him. And of course, that word follow can have some different meanings, can't it? Uh, there were followers who were absolutely committed all in. Peter was a follower and he's cutting off ears in the garden trying to save Jesus, right? He was all in, at least he seemed to be in that moment. And then there are other followers like the John 6 followers who heard some teaching that they didn't like. And what did they do? Yeah, they walked away and they stopped following him, not, not very committed. And so I think probably what we're ending up with is the fact that there are all kinds of people in this crowd that has come to hear Jesus. And then if you look at chapter 5 in verse 1, the text says that Jesus sees the crowd. You see that? In fact, they are the reason... The sermon is preached. That's what prompts him to do it. Those logistical matters that we talked about where he goes up to this place and, and sits down. He's not trying to get away from the crowd. At least I don't believe he's trying to do that. I think he's trying to, to get in a, a useful place that will allow him to teach the crowd. It's a good vantage point to speak to the masses. The Lord is seizing the opportunity. But I'm wondering if what he's going to try to do with the sermon may be similar to what he did in John 6. He's going to try to cull through this crowd and find out who is really with me and who's just hanging on. And so maybe that would be an interesting way to read the sermon, to read through it and think, is there anything here that might sort of separate the sheep from the goat, so to speak? Figure out who's really in and who's not in. Let me pause for a minute and just, uh, and just ask you, do you see anything for us, any lessons here for us as we talk about the crowd, some things we should take away and learn? Yeah, David. 
and, th and there is that transition he's trying to make between the miracle to the implication of it. Because what's the implication of the miracle? What was the purpose of the miracle? To show that he was the son of God. To show that, that he was who he claimed to be. And we should listen to him. He taught them as one having authority. Remember that as you're reading this coming week. Uh, what else? Thank you. What? I mean, it seems like in, as opposed to John 6 where the crowd stopped following him, the Sermon on the Mount seems to be aimed at raising up the average Joe while also It, it challenges in a different way, doesn't it? The challenge of John 6 was, we don't get what in the world you mean by eating your flesh and drinking your blood. The challenge here is, you want me to forgive my enemies, and I don't want to do that. I want to get even with them, right? It's a different, different kind of challenge. Calling us to that, I like the, the fact that you guys keep using that idea of a higher calling, a higher life. Do I want, do I want to live like he lived? And, uh, and higher than what they've been called to before by or, their spiritual Yes, yes, he's going to fuss about that. Yeah, Rick? Please, yes, what does it say? I, I, I think it, it's a call to, to look at, we are the crowd, so why are we here? What are we looking for? How do we approach worship? How do we approach God's word when we're reading it? What are we trying to do? Yeah, I, I thought about that as I was reading that this week and thinking about the crowds. Um, there are different kinds of followers, so what kind am I? And I really think that at the end of the day, that's what we need to do with the sermon. We need to figure out what he was saying to them. And then in the end, what did that mean to us? And how does it apply to us? Because can there be different kind of followers today? I mean, look at, look at, look at all the people in the world who claim an allegiance to Jesus, including us. And so I think we need to ask that tough question. If the followers can be very different kinds, what kind am I? And then, and, then, and then bear this in mind too, that the, the, the teaching of Jesus, the teaching of Jesus was often designed to help draw that line and say, are you with me or are you not? And, and so how do we respond when the teaching of Jesus is hard for me? And not all of it is. Listen, I married a great woman. When the Bible says love your wife, that's easy for me, Right? But when he says, love your enemies, and I'm on Luetta, <laughs> it's hard, right? It's hard. So what happens when it's hard for me, like, like it was hard for people in this crowd? I think that's when we find out if we're with him or not. And then the last thing I want to mention is we think about the fact that they came from all over. Would we remember this in our time, that the kingdom is meant to be filled up with people from all over, all over the globe? all kind of different backgrounds and experiences. I used to say all the time, go share the gospel with your friends and neighbors. And it dawned on me how utterly inadequate that is. I'm not supposed to share the gospel with everybody, not just the people who dwell in my circle. Anybody I can get to listen to me, I need to share the message with them, which may sometimes be people very, very, very different from me. So all kinds made up this crowd. All right, I need to press on. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. As an aside, I'm so tempted to go down this road because, <laughs> because, because what I love it, read the gospel sometimes and pay attention to how Jesus freaked out the twelve all the time. I mean, Jesus was not ever doing what he was supposed to be doing. And you just, you just know that Peter and John walked around most of the time going, what is he doing? This isn't the way it's supposed to happen, you know? And it's, they're just some really great moments I think we miss sometimes. Let me give you a second word uh, that I think is an important connecting thread in these first four chapters. And that is the word kingdom. 
so if you look back at chapter 4 and verse 23, he's preaching or proclaiming rather the gospel of the kingdom. And so when I saw that, it nudged me. And I began to wonder, well, uh, are there any other ideas about kingdom leading up to this? Because if we are correct, preaching of the gospel of the kingdom looks like what's in the Sermon on the Mount. So if that's the the message of the kingdom, uh, do we have anything else about that? And I think we do. Uh, In John, or I'm sorry, in Matthew 3 and verse 2, when John the Baptist comes on the sin kingdom, do you, or comes on the scene rather, you see that in verse two. What's he saying? The kingdom is at hand. And then in chapter four, in verse seventeen, that's what Jesus said: "Repent, for the kingdom is at hand." And so, and so, just prior to this, both John the Baptist and Jesus are announcing the time is here for the kingdom. But I don't think we're done with that because then you back up to chapter two. And there's this interesting story that Matthew chooses. And listen, that's such an important thing to remember when you study the Bible. Think about all of the information that could have been included about the birth of Jesus. In fact, stuff that the Holy Spirit left out. And I'm just thinking, why didn't you tell us that? I mean, could you at least give us a picture of what, of what the barn looked like so we could know about, about what the nativity was, right? You know, there's so many interesting things we could have been told. Pay attention to what we are told and what is included. And so when Matthew tells the story, he chooses to tell us, he chooses to tell about these magi, these Gentiles who come seeking him. There's another little Gentile thread there, right? And who do the magi come seeking? They come looking for the king of the Jews, which freaks out who? Herod the king. In fact, there's an interesting interplay at the beginning of chapter 2 between this idea of king of the Jews and, and notice Matthew keeps saying Herod the king, Herod the king, Herod the king. And so now we've got two kings in conflict with each other. In fact, he quotes from, uh, from Micah's prophecy about how the ruler is going to come from Bethlehem. And so this idea has been already working in Matthew's writing leading up into chapter 5. And then you get into chapter 5, 6, and 7. Is there anything in the Sermon on the Mount about the kingdom? I, yeah, I mean, twice in the Beatitudes, the kingdom belongs to these people. Or to put it another way, this is who gets to be in my kingdom, right? And he works it the other way too, doesn't he? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, right? He said the same thing, what, at 520, he talks about who will be in the kingdom and who will not be in the kingdom. In 633, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So it seems to me that there's another thread we need to pull through there that's been working in these chapters that lead up to the sermon, and that is kingdom. In chapter 2, the king has come into the world. And then in chapter 3 and 4, first John, then Jesus announced, this is the time for the kingdom. And I think what you have then in chapter 5, 6, and 7 is Matthew building on that. Do you see that? Because... Yeah, I'm glad you said that. That's a great additional thought that in re- really it is the genealogy of the king, isn't it? So all the way through this, that idea has been building until we get to this chapter. And now the king himself, could we say it this way, is giving the terms of interest, in- entrance. Here's who's in. Yeah, citizenship. And here's and here who's who is not going to be in. So let me pause again and ask any lessons maybe we should take away from this kingdom idea that's working its way up to and then through the Sermon on the Mount? Anything for us to learn in that? Well, I was just gonna mention in the in the model for prayer, it's mentioned twice. Yeah. So it's also something that we should be mindful of in our prayers, be thankful for this kingdom for this power. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Yeah, there's another reference to it there. You're right about that. It is. And so, and so maybe if I can hijack your point, Susan, which those who are in the evangelism class know that I do this all the time. Um, uh, perhaps we too need to ponder whether we define kingdom in our terms and not his and make it what we want to be rather than what he said it was. And it sure seems like the Sermon on the Mount would be a great place to sort of pause and let the king speak. Yes? Jim feels like this, the things that he's teaching in the sermon is to everybody. Anybody can trick or any the right way. Everybody can, you know, it's very simple. Judge any of all the stuff that's in here. Anybody, Gentiles and Jews. Gentiles and Jews. Yes. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. One of the things that occurred to me as I, as I pondered this the last week is the way kingdom defines a relationship, right? Do, do you see that? I don't know that that connects well with us because we don't have kings anymore. Uh, we have people that we elect and put into power, and when we don't like what they do, what do we do? We vote them out. We, we don't live under a king who gets to say what the law is by his royal edict and whatever he says we're stuck with because he's the king. Please understand that that is exactly the kingdom that Jesus invites us to be part of. Not a democracy. It is a totalitarian dictatorship. Let's be grateful he is a benevolent king because he is the king nonetheless, which means he rules and I, I obey. I do what he says. We don't, we don't vote on the loving your enemy segment. We don't get to pass over it and say, I think that's hard. I don't think I'm going to do that. And so I actually think that's important because the relationship underlies the sermon. Or to put it another way, Kingdom citizenship hinges on our willingness to hear the king. In fact, I think the whole last part of chapter 7 is really talking about that decision. Will we travel his road? Will we listen to his voice? Will we build on his foundation? Who is the wise man in the parable at the end of the sermon? The one who does what? Yes, but what is that? The one who does what? Hears him and acts on his words. He is the wise man that is building on a solid foundation. So, so um, as, a, as a practical thought to sort of work behind the scenes as we look at the sermon, am I that citizen who has submitted to the king. You know what he said in, in the retelling in Luke 6, why do you call me Lord, Lord? And what? You want to know how that ends? And do not do what I say. It defines a relationship. So I wonder, I wonder, uh, am I the rebel resisting or am I the humble servant who bows the knee to the benevolent king and, and does what he says? Because the fact that it's kingdom defines the nature of our relationship. Does that make sense? And so that's what we're getting into as we go through the sermon. What the king said about being in his kingdom. And being part of it. The, uh, the, the temptation of Christ also has a kingdom aspect. It does. Tries to give, says, I, I, I've got control of all the 
Yeah, I was going to bring that up, John, and I was really afraid it'd be a can of worms. So, uh, uh, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. So I'm throwing you under the bus there. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it's a legit offer. It's a different kind of kingdom that he's offering. Okay, real quick before I'm out of time, let me just ask you to think about one more word, because when I read these first four chapters leading up to the sermon, uh, I see a lot of conflict. Do you see that too? And thank you for bringing up the temptation because the immediate battle that is right before this is between Jesus and who? Satan. You realize that? Just before we get to the sermon, there's the battle between uh, Jesus and the devil. And then backing up to chapter 3, you have John the Baptist who's teaching and who comes out to hear him and be baptized? The Pharisees and the Sadducees and boy, that's an interesting exchange there. Boy, you think Jeff and I can preach a little starchy sometimes. Go back and read that sermon and listen, we're mild. Lord was, or John was, was straight up with these guys. And did you back up before that at the beginning of chapter 2? We've already talked about the conflict between Herod the king and Jesus the king as Herod tries to destroy him. And so it just seems to me as we walk through these early chapters that conflict has been a piece of this all the way through. And the truth is after we leave chapter 7 and finish the Sermon on the Mount, what's going to happen to the conflict? Yeah, it's going to grow and intensify. Their anger is going to build to the point of rage where ultimately they, 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 they kill Jesus on a cross. By the way, who's the one behind all of that? Yeah, and so that piece of these early chapters is important because right there, Matthew tells us who the ultimate adversary is. He's the one battling against the Lord behind the scenes. And so, and so all the way through, in fact, think about how far that takes us back. Now we're, now we're linking all the way back to the Garden of Eden and the battle that's been going on since the beginning of time. So how's that relevant to the sermon? I think the struggle is in there too. So 713, enter through the narrow gate, right? Because the way, the broad way is the way that leads to destruction. So there are these two paths and the adversary pulls us one direction and the king pulls us the other direction. And the great question of the sermon is whose voice are we going to hear? So let me urge you as the last, that was my second bell, right? Uh, let me urge you, maybe take some time this week to read the first four chapters and to look for the crowd and the kingdom and the conflict and see those big ideas that are working up to the sermon and then I think finding their way into the sermon. And then when we get to the next time, we're going to talk about the teacher behind the lesson because when it was over, that's what the people were talking about. So we want to spend some time talking about that too. Thank you. Thanks, Will. Appreciate it.